أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى آل بيتك المظلومين الغر الميامين روحي وأرواح العالمين لكم الفداء صلى الله عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة غريب يا مظلوم كربلة سيدي يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيم قال سيدنا ومولانا علي بن موسى الرضا من زارني في غربتي وعلى بعد داري زرته يوم القيامة في ثلاث مواطن وخلصته من أهوالها عند تطاير الكتب وعند الصراط وعند الميزان To offer our condolences to the Master, the Imam of our time, the awaited Savior, and to make this tragedy a little easier for him, Recite aloud salawat upon his grandfather Rasulullah and his immaculate progeny with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> to receive the intercession of the eighth Imam in the hereafter as well as the privilege of his visitation in this world, recite another salawat. <laughs> to hasten the reappearance of Imam Zaman, the Avenger, the awaited Savior, recite an even louder salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> A period of mourning and lamentation, intense crying for the tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt is about to come to a close. Two months 
the months of Muharram and Safar were times when the true lovers and followers of the Ahlul Bayt would turn their lives upside down, where priorities shifted and the routine revolved around gathering where the tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt are mentioned and we cried, wept, lamented, shared the grief of the angels in the sky, the damsels in paradise, as well as that of the Messenger of Allah and his family. And as this period of intense lamentation comes to an end, there's a natural feeling of anticipating compensation and reward, hoping that now that we've gone through this transformative time, this period of cleansing our souls, that we're going to get something in the form of a reward at the end of it all. In fact, the Iranians have a famous chant where they visit the shrines of the Imams in particular, that of the eighth Imam, and they say, Ma Muzda Azadari as Mi We wish for Fatima to Zahra, the mistress of the women of the world, to compensate us for all that we have done over the last two months. I'd like to think of it in a different way. Instead of me expecting some kind of reward, really the way I should look at this is instead of asking Fatima to Zahra or the Imams for a compensation or a reward, what I would say instead is I apologize to you for not having been able or not having exerted enough effort into lamenting and commemorating the tragedy of your son Hussein and your daughter Zainab in a way that is befitting to that tragedy. The Imams don't owe us anything. Some of you participated in Ziyaratul Arba'een. Some of you have just returned from that trip. This human tsunami of virtue and morality and generosity, this beautiful march where millions of people take part in order to share the grief of Lady Zainab and Sakina and Ruqayya. And you saw what you saw. This demonstration that really cannot be put into words. The best way I could describe it, as I said a couple of nights ago, was that it's a miracle in the works. It's a miracle that is unfolding before our two eyes. And as the miracle unfolds, it's impossible to describe it. Because we fail to un appreciate and understand it's technical underpinnings because there are no technical underpinnings. The very definition of a miracle is that it is beyond human comprehension. It defies the laws of physics and chemistry. And so we fail to understand it. And so we call it a miracle. There's another way to describe it, and that is to say that it's reverse begging. You have beggars all over the world. They come to you and they ask you for help. They ask you for a handout. They ask you for some change. But when you align yourself with the legend that is Aba Abdullah al Hussein, suddenly you yourself defy the laws of physics. Suddenly the traditional meaning of begging that we are too familiar with is reversed. Instead of people begging 
for you to give them something. Now they're begging for you to take from them, not the other way around. So some of you have been to Arba'een and you've seen what I'm talking about. And yet, Imam al Hussein owes us nothing. We are the ones who are thankful for Imam al Hussein having brought us to his doorstep, having introduced us to his legend and to his system of morality and ethics that is far superior than anything humanity has been able to produce. And so, as this period of lamentation comes to an end, we hope that we're going to get something in return. Again, not because the Imams owe us anything, but because we know they are too generous to bring us all the way to the water and then lead us away without quenching our thirst. They're too gracious to invite us into their home, into their shrine, into their mausoleum, into their Husseiniyat and Imam Bargas around the world. The shrine of Imam al Hussein is right here. The grave of Hussein is inside the heart of anyone who loves Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And for them to invite us all the way here, but not cure my sicknesses, my diseases. And I'm not just talking about my superficial physical diseases, I'm talking about my spiritual disease. I'm talking about all the ailments that I suffer from, which aren't so readily visible, which aren't too easily curable, which require a divinely inspired doctor, require the Imam himself to take yet another look at this peasant that I am and salvage me from my sins. So that is what we hope to get as this period of mourning comes to an end, insha'Allah. And in particular, tonight, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Why is tonight so special? Because tonight we commemorate the tragedy of an Imam who had a title which was rather unique. Let me say something before I explain this. The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, the infallible, inerrant progeny of the Messenger of Allah, they were all equal in terms of their divine authority, in terms of their imamate, if you like, in terms of their injunctions being obligatory, in terms of their status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in terms of them being muftaradu ta'a, as the hadiths put it, meaning that if they issue a command, it must be obeyed. No questions asked. They and their words are a reflection of God's wishes and desires, right? In that sense, the Ahlul Bayt were equal, beginning from the Holy Messenger of Allah and ending with the 12th Imam. However, each of the Imam, each of the inerrant progeny members of the Prophet of Allah, they had their own unique qualities. They had their own features that distinguished them from one another. That's not to say that they were better than one another. That's not to compare them in as far as their status and position in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concerned. Rather, it's that each Imam shined in a particular way. It's, it's like they say each flower has a different pleasant scent. It's not that each flower is better than the other, or this gem has this kind of feature or that kind of color. Again, it doesn't matter that it doesn't mean that it's more valuable or better. It just means that it's different. It means that it can be sought for different reasons at different times. I don't really want to delve into this too much because each of the Imam had their own unique qualities and attributes and features that were way beyond my personal comprehension or understanding. 
However, you look at the Holy Messenger of Allah and what was unique about him is more than I can mention in a lecture or a sermon. But suffice to say that he was the Imam of all of the Imams. He was the leader of all the divinely inspired leaders. He is Rasulullah, God's final messenger. Which is why the Imams always looked up to the Prophet. The commander of the faithful himself says in that famous conversation between him and Asbagh ibn Nabata, when Asbagh asks the Imam whether he is better, he is superior, or the other prophets and apostles of Allah, and the Imam explains how he is far superior from the other apostles of Allah until the conversation reaches the Holy Messenger of God, at which point he stops the one asking the questions, Asbagh ibn Nabata, and he says to him, Waihak, woe unto you, an abdun min abidi Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. I am but a slave of the final messenger. All of the Imam, even though the commander of the faithful was to the Prophet, like Harun was to Musa, the commander of the faithful was the brother of the Prophet, was the cousin of the Prophet, was the successor of the Prophet. He was in fact the Prophet himself, according to Ayat al-Mubahala. However, they all looked up to the Prophet because of those unique qualities and that set of features that the Prophet had and no one else did. The same is true of the commander of the faithful. The same is true of Imam al Hassan. The same is true of Imam al Hussein. There are things about Imam al Hussein that are quite unique. An entire book has been compiled by one of our most senior ulama, Ayatullah Shaykh al Tustari, called Al Khasa'is al Husseiniyya. The unique features of Imam al Hussein, an entire book, three, four hundred pages long. And these are features that were unique to Imam al Hussein. No other Imams had them. Once again, it doesn't mean that Imam al Hussein was better than Imam al Hassan, but these are features that were unique to him. We have traditions, for instance, that refer to the last Imam, to the awaited Savior, to the twelfth inerrant member of the household of purity and infallibility as Nuru Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He is the light of the progeny of Rasulullah. That description has not been used with any other Imam. What does it mean? Once again, it's not a question of superiority versus inferiority. It's a question of uniqueness. It's a question of being distinguishable, distinguished. And the traditions explain why he's given that title. One hadith says that when he reappears, يَنْتَشِرُ نُورُهُ فِي الْأَرْجَاءِ حَتَّى يَسْتَغْنِ النَّاسُ بِنُورِهِ عَنْ نُورِ الشَّمْسِ the light of the twelfth Imam will be so bright when he reappears. It'll be so bright that it will penetrate every object, every home, every room, every window, every door. We'll see that light shine through it to the point, the Imam says, that people will no longer have any need for the sun's rays because they have the light of the twelfth Imam. These are some of the unique features of each particular Imam. The eighth Imam, brothers and sisters, has his own set of unique features. One of the unique titles attributed to him is Al Alimu Min Ali Muhammad. The scholar, the erudite, the possessor of knowledge. Did the other Imams not possess knowledge? Of course they did. But there was something unique about Imam al Rida. If you look at Imam al Hassan, for instance, and of course, 
He is the Sibt, the first grandson of Rasulullah. He is the one who inherited prophetic attributes directly from his grandfather. And yet, sadly, tragically, through the oppression that history practiced on the Ahlul Bayt, as well as the oppression that was practiced by the enemies of the Imams in their own lifetime, if you collect all of the traditions of Imam al-Hasan, they will equal about three, maybe even less than 300 pages. Imam al-Hasan never really had a chance to disseminate the knowledge of the Messenger of Allah. From war to war, from battle to battle, Muawiyah of all people challenging the authority of Abi Muhammad and al-Hasan and then for him to be poisoned to death, his untimely death by his own wife, the person that you're supposed to trust with your innermost secrets is the one who turns against you and murders you. Imam al-Hasan never really had the chance. If you put all the traditions of Imam al Hussein together, you end up with about three, four hundred pages. That's all. If you take the traditions of the latter Imam, such as Imam al Hadi, you know that Imam al Hadi was not even given the chance to perform the pilgrimage to the house of Allah. He wasn't able to perform the Hajj, which any regular Muslim is able to do. And God vicegerent on earth was not permitted to go to Hajj. If you collect all of his traditions, you'll end up with about 100, maybe 150 pages. The same is true of Imam al-Askari, the same is true of other Imam. So, while the other Imam were not able or did not get the chance to disseminate the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt, Imam al-Ridha was a different case altogether. Imam al Ridha was able to put on display the knowledge of God Himself as transmitted to the Holy Messenger of Allah and from one Imam to the next. And He was able to put all of that on display. How? Through His public sermons, through His audiences and meetings with delegations and individuals. Remember Imam al Ridha was given the title, was rather forced upon him, but the title of crown prince gave the Imam some leeway. It gave him some flexibility as far as speaking out in public, not being hindered, not being prevented from speaking. Even Imam al Sadiq was not allowed to do that. While Imam al-Sadiq was able to give lessons in the mosque and teach people matters of jurisprudence, it wasn't the case of anyone wishing to visit the Imam could simply get an appointment, visit him in his home and listen to him directly. People weren't allowed to do that. He was still being persecuted. He was still being watched. Imam al-Sadiq himself says to Unwan al-Basri, he says to him, Inni rajulun muraqab. I have a lot of spies, I have a lot of eyes on me. I'm being persecuted. The only thing I'm able to do is to go to the mosque, give my class and then go straight back home. But it was a different case when it came to the 8th Imam. So in addition to the sermon, lectures, public, as well as private meetings and audiences, Imam al Ridha also participated in those very famous and legendary debates between him on the one hand and the leaders of the major religious and faith traditions of the day. It was Ma'moon's way of either humiliating Imam al Ridha and showing him to be a regular person who speaks, who talks the talk, but is unable to walk the walk. As far as Ma'moon was concerned, it was win-win. Either Imam al Ridha is unable to deliver, or if he does, then he 
takes all the credit. He is able to claim, as he did at the end of those debates, he would remind everyone that this is my cousin Ali ibn Musarraba. He's my cousin. All of a sudden, the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt were cousins to Bani al-Abbas. All of a sudden, they remembered that these were their relatives. Which was another way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completed his proof on Ma'mun. If he is indeed your cousin, then why poison him to death? If you are related to him, then why kill him? But the point is that Imam al Rida was given the opportunity to sit in those public forums and to disseminate the knowledge of the Messenger of Allah such that he was awarded the title of the erudite and the possessor of knowledge from among the household of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So that's one of the titles. And I would encourage you to refer to the book of Ihtijaj. Brothers and sisters, sadly, most of us are content with what we get from the mimba. Most of us are happy to maybe attend the majlis, listen to a lecture on YouTube, and we feel good about doing our bit when it comes to matters of religiosity. I've done my bit. I've listened to the lecture. And I do that once or twice a year when it comes to Imam al-Ridha on his birth anniversary as well as his martyrdom commemoration. But that's just not enough, brothers and sisters. When we are asked in the grave, Man Imam, who is your Imam? Or when we visit their shrine, numerous traditions state that when you visit the shrines of the Ahlul Bayt, you are rewarded. But you want to maximize those rewards? Here's what you need to do. Manzarahu arifan You must visit the Imam knowing the Imam's right upon you, knowing who you're visiting. Not just visit the Imam whose first name and whose father's name and maybe some details about his life I happen to have picked up when I used to go to Madrasa as a child. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's try and immunize ourselves against the barrage of misconceptions, the endless doubts that we are subjected to on a daily basis nowadays. Our youngsters, our youth go to university. Sometimes they veer off and they listen to people they're not supposed to be listen, listening to. They hear people they're not supposed to be hearing. We have a whole host of a hadith talking about how it's important to be very discerning when it comes to who you choose as your source of knowledge. فَلْيَنظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ The holy verse in the Qur'an says, man should look at the food that he consumes. Imam al-Sadiq says, when it comes to physical food, everybody looks into their food. Everybody examines it before they consume it, before they eat it. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here is you should look at the knowledge that you take from which sources do you take it. Let's be discerning. Let's be careful. Let's not just open up under the garb of, oh, we're followers of the Ahlul Bayt. We're not afraid of anybody. Of course we're afraid. The doubts and misconceptions are all around us. We have to be afraid. If we're not afraid, it's like somebody going into the infectious diseases section in a hospital and saying, oh, I'm strong, I work out in the gym, I have no reason to be afraid. You have every reason to be afraid. Just because you happen to be healthy doesn't mean that you're immune from diseases, especially infectious diseases. And these are spiritually infectious diseases. Doubts, misconceptions. And the worst part is, sometimes this very sacred mimbar is used to deliver doubts and misconceptions. Who says this and who says that? I'm not someone who is tasked with the very sensitive position of sitting on this mimbar to ask questions. I'm not supposed to be asking questions. Who says this and who says that is a series of questions. 
I should be providing answers. If you see somebody asking questions on the mimbar, tell them, I'm sorry, maybe you shouldn't be sitting on the mimbar. This mimbar isn't a piece of furniture, brothers and sisters. This is a sacred institution that has preserved our faith for centuries. Let's not just hand it over to just about anyone. Our youth go and they listen to people and they read things. You're one click away from doubting your entire faith tradition. Sometimes you're one YouTube video away from questioning everything that you've been taught from childhood. Because that's how misconception works. The word shubha, which literally translates as misconception, shubha is called shubha because it's, it stems from the word yeshba, shabah. Shabah means resemblance, something that looks like something. In other words, it's like having two currencies, one that is original and the other that is counterfeit. Now, what makes a counterfeit currency dangerous is the fact that it resembles an original, real currency. If it looked fake, it wouldn't be dangerous. If it looked fake, we wouldn't have any problem. The problem with misconception is that it sounds reasonable. It actually sounds pretty logical. But that's only on the surface. And that's why we need to immunize ourselves. Going back to the point that I was making earlier, we need to immunize ourselves. We need to strengthen our spiritual and intellectual and belief-based immune system so that next time we come across one tiny little misconception, we don't come crumbling down. How do we do that? Read the debates of the Imams with their enemy. Refer to, the, to Kitab al-Ihtijaj by Shaykh al-Ta'ifah, as Shaykh al-Tusi radhwanullah ta'ala alayhi. It's been translated into English. Read those debates. You'll learn a great deal. Moving on. One of the other titles that the eighth Imam is given by the Imams themselves is one that is mentioned in a particular ziyara for Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al-Jawad alayhi salam who is buried in Kavameen. In that ziyara, we say the following, As-salamu ala al-imam al-ra'uf الذي هيج أحزان يوم الكفر. Let's try and look at this a little bit. Inshallah, in the remaining time that we have. Again, remember the idea is for us, while we have no sense of entitlement whatsoever, while I know I am nothing but a pile of shortcomings when it comes to lamenting the tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt, but deep down I still say, Ya Ali ibn Musa Rida, it's the last day of this period. Give me something. Don't let, let me go back empty handed. Assalamu ala al Imam al Ra'uf. Peace be upon the very compassionate Imam. Imam al Rida was compassionate, as was every other Imam. But there's something unique about Imam al Rida, about our eighth Imam. May God's peace and everlasting blessings be upon him. How is that? Let me mention a few hadiths for you to help you transition into the point that I'm trying to make, inshallah. The Imams genuinely cared for their followers. In fact, I mentioned the hadith just last night when the angel Jibra'il descends upon the Prophet, when he was in the company of his immediate family, and the Prophet told them that Jibra'il is here with a message. The message is, you will be tested, you will be tried, you will undergo calamities and tragedies. Will you be patient? And they all said, 
إذا كان هذا ما يريده الله فنعم if God wants us to do so then we will be patient now the imams would endure unspeakable tragedy for what exactly for whose sake for you and I it's like the story of Musa and the sheep when Musa was a shepherd they genuinely care about us they see us as their children and if your child veers off to one direction or if he goes astray to another at the end of the day he's still your child and you will spare no effort in trying to bring him back if your child is suffering if your child needs money if your child is sick you're more than willing to put away your own health your own wealth your own comfort so that your child will find some relief the imams care about their followers even more than a compassionate mother looks at her own nursing child the hadith says in one particular tradition imam al rida says he describes the role of an imam and he says al imam al abu الشفيع والأخ الشقيق والأنيس الرفيع. He says an imam is an intimate friend who spares no effort in helping you in your hour of need. An imam is a father whose compassion towards his child knows no limits. An imam is like a brother from the same set of parents, from the same father and the same mother. An imam is like a mother who cares for her child. This is what an imam is. There's one particular story that is, that really drives the point home in which a man who happened to be one of the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander of the faithful, one day he falls sick. And for a few days he wasn't able to go to the mosque, he wasn't able to meet the imam, so he stays at home while he recuperates. One day, which happened to be on a Friday, he says that I woke up and I felt just a little bit better and felt that I had some strength in me. So I thought to myself, then, there's nothing better for me to do than perform ghusl, al-jumu'ah, and go to the mosque and pray salatul jumu'ah behind the commander of the faithful himself and then listen to his sermon. So I performed ghusl, went to the mosque, sat in front of the imam, listened to the Friday sermon, performed salatul jumu'ah, and then the Imam finished. As he was about to finish, I felt the sickness come back. So I felt weaker and I felt more tired. But the Imam was about to leave the mosque. So I got up and I hurried behind him because I couldn't get enough of that light that emanated and rayed from the face of, the, of Amir al Mu'mineen. So I went behind him. The Imam looked at me. He said to me, it's been a while, we haven't seen you in, a, in quite some time. So he told the Imam that I've been sick. The Imam said, I know that. You were sick. But today you woke up and you were feeling a little bit better. So you thought to yourself, what better can I do than perform ghusl, than go to the mosque and participate in Friday prayers. And that's exactly what you did. So you came, you listened to the sermon, you performed Salatul Jumu'ah, then you felt sick again. So he said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, by God, that is exactly what happened to me. How do you know that? What a silly question that is, right? The Imam said to him, How do I know that? Don't you know that when you get sick, we get sick? When you pray to Allah, we ask God, to fulfill your wishes and desires. We say, Ameen, whenever you 
raise your hands in dua. And when you fail to do dua, then we do dua for you. I know exactly what you go through. You're one of us, aren't you? You're one of my followers. So he says, I, I was amazed. I said to the Imam, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Ayakunu dhalika lil lishi'atika min al Kufa. Is this something that's exclusive to the people of Kufa? In other words, do you have access to that information because we happen to be a closely knit community? Or does your knowledge go beyond the people who live right around the corner? The Imam said this encompasses every single one of our followers, every single one of our Shia. When they fall sick, we fall sick. Allahu Akbar. So the compassion, the mercy, the love of the Ahlul Bayt towards the, their followers knows no limit. There's another story that's quite moving and there are lessons to be learned from it inshallah. A man goes to the holy city of Medina. This person according to the hadith happened to be a local king. If you like a very senior tribal chief, someone with a lot of wealth, a lot of authority within his tribe, within his town or city, from the southern strip of Iran. And so he used to perform the Hajj. On that particular year, he went to Medina, as he did every single year. He would go to Medina, visit the Imam of his time, Imam al Sadiq, then go to Mecca to perform the rituals of Hajj. But on that year, when he went to Medina, he would stay with the Imam al-Sadiq in his home. So he said to the Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I come here every year and I stay with you and I trouble you with my presence. So from next year on, I'd like to relieve you of my troubles. And in order to do that, I'd like to buy my own home right here in Medina, somewhere that's close to you. I'd very much like to come to Medina first because that is the whole point of Hajj, to visit you. But I don't know my way around Medina. I don't know the neighborhoods. I don't know the prices. I will give you the money and ask you to buy me a house. Can you do that? The Imam said, sure. So he took the money and the man set out for Mecca. He went to Hajj and came back. When he came back, he asked the Imam, he said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I asked you to buy me a house. Did you buy me a house? The Imam said, yes, I bought you the best of homes. On the one hand, on the right hand side, your neighbor is Rasulullah himself. On the left hand side, your neighbor is Amir al Mu'mineen. Behind you is the house of Imam al Hassan. Right in front of you is the house of Imam al Hussein. He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, where is this house? that I hear of, I've never seen such a home. Where, is it, where exactly is it? The Imam said to him, it's in paradise. Instead of buying you a house, I took that money and I gave it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I helped those who were destitute, those who are poor. And so I bought you the house in paradise. And so this brother, I don't know exactly where he came from. But I must say, reading the rest of the story, you get the sense that he had some Khoja blood in him. Because he was very smart. He wasn't just content with that. He said to the Imam, if that is the case, can you please put it in writing? I want a contract. Not because he mistrusted, distrusted the Imam, but because he wanted something to hold on to. And so the Imam said, of course, I'll put it in writing. Give me a pen, give me a paper. And he started writing. This is a covenant between the sixth Imam and this man that I have sold him a house in paradise. On the right hand side is the house of Rasulullah. On the left hand side, the house of Amir al Mu'mineen. The rest of the description was all put into writing. The contract was signed and sealed, handed over 
to the buyer. The man took that contract. He traveled back home. Why did the Imam do this? When he was asked to buy an actual physical home in this world as opposed to in paradise, because the Imam knew that that was the last and final year of Hajj for this man, that he would die in that very year. And so he took the contract, went back home. As soon as he arrived, he fell sick. The sickness was exacerbated. And day after day, it became worse and worse and worse until he realized that he was not going to make it. One day, he invited all of his children and his family, and he told them that when I die, when you finish with my burial, I would like you to take this contract and place it on my chest. This is my ticket into paradise. This is the covenant of Ja'far ibn Muhammad and Sadiq. Make sure you bury me with it. And so he died soon after that. His children buried him, and before laying the soil over his body, they placed that contract on his chest. The next day they came back to pay their respects to recite Fatiha when they noticed a big leaf on his grave. They looked at the leaf and there was an inscription on it. The inscription was a message from the hereafter, from their father to them. And it read, لَقَدْ وَفَى إِلَيَّ مَوْلَاي جَعْفَرُ بْنُ مُحَمَّدٍ الصَّادِقِ my master, Imam al-Sadiq, has fulfilled his promise to me. And he has delivered on his promise in paradise. The Ahlul Bayt, brothers and sisters, their compassion, their love, their mercy towards us knows no limits. One final story, inshaAllah. Imam al-Ridha came to Nishabu. That migration, from Medina to Naishabur and from Naishabur to Tus and specifically to the city of Marv, which was the capital of the Abbasid Empire, that movement, if we were to chart the most significant turning point in the history of Shia Islam, this would be one of them. The migration of Imam al Riva from Medina to Naishabur in particular. There are many reasons for that which I don't want to get into. But one of the incidents that took place during that trip is what I'd like to draw your attention to. Imam al Ridha is approaching Naishabur. Thousands upon thousands of people go out of the city in order to welcome the holy Imam. Historians say that there were 24,000 people with golden ink holders that were waiting to inscribe the hadith known as hadith silsilat al dhahab the hadith of the golden chain right you know the hadith 24000 people with golden ink holders meaning that these were 24000 professional scribes 24000 professional historians and writers of hadith and this doesn't include all the thousands and thousands of other people who were regular Shia who came to welcome the Imam into the city of Naishabur. So you can imagine the commotion. You can imagine just what a grand celebration this was. So everybody sets out. Everybody leaves. Except for one elderly man. This person was too sick to walk. He was disabled. But he sees his children, his son, as they're about to leave the house. He says to them, I wish I could join you. I wish I could see the Imam, but I can't. So convey my salams to him. When everybody leaves a short while later, this man is sitting in his home. He hears a knock at his door. He struggles to the door, opens it, and it's the eighth Imam, Ali ibn Musa al-Rida. Alayhi alafu tahiyyati was salam who has come to visit him. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ya ibn Rasulullah, what brings you to my humble abode? What brings you to my home? Who am I to receive you as a guest? The Imam said to him, I came to you because I knew how much your heart desires to come to see me. Instead, I have come to see you. Allahu Akbar. So the Imam 
please come on in. Ya ibn Rasulullah, you're such an honorable guest. The Imam comes inside, he sits down. This person happened to be a barber in his youth. And so he says to the Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I have nothing to offer you. I'm so sorry, my house is empty, there's no food, there's no fruits. But I do still retain the skill of shaving people's heads. Would you give me the honor of shaving your head? The Imam says, sure. It's all he has to offer. So he picks up a blade. He begins to shave the Imam's head. He finishes. So then the Imam points to the blade that was used to shave him. He gives it one quick tap and turns it into solid gold. He says to him, old man, this is your reward. Accept it from me as a gift. The old man looked at the blade. He said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I don't want the gold. I want you. What exactly do you want? He said, at the moment of my death, I wish for you to be at my bedside. I don't want the gold. I don't want the money. I want nothing. Just be there for me. The imam said, yeah. A few months later, the imam had already arrived in Tus. Some companions said that we were in the presence of Imam al-Rida. When suddenly he stood up, he left the room. He then came back. Ibn Rasulullah, where did you go? He said, that old barber was on his deathbed. I just went to Naishabur to be with him at the moment, at his hour of need, at the moment of his death, in order to fulfill that promise. Now, let me wrap up with this. This is a story that has a very solid chain of narrators. There are two chains that I can mention. I'll mention one which has to do directly with myself. One of my uncles is Ayatollah Sayyid Abbas al-Mudarrisi. He was a student of Grand Ayatollah Sheikh Ja'far al Sheikh Murtad al haid Sheikh Murtad al-Hari was a marja' in Qum. He was the son of the founder of the Hawza, the Islamic seminary in Qum. Ayatollah Sheikh Abdul Karim al-Hari was his father. Ayatollah Sheikh Murtad al-Hari, try and retain that name in your head. He was not just one of the most senior ulama, but also a very pious, very cautious, very meticulous, kind of alim. So much so that you know how it's customary for us to say marhum this, marhum that, marhumin. When they mentioned someone in his presence who was deceased, he would say, but how do I know whether he's truly marhum or not? How do I know if I can say marhum and grant this person that title? He was very meticulous, very careful, very cautious, right? He has many qualities that were truly unique, which we don't have time to get into, but an incredible scholar and a great erudite. This person falls sick. This alim, this marja, gets sick. My uncle says that I went to pay him a visit. He was his teacher, remember? He said, I went to visit him when he was on his bed. He was bed bound with another alim. This alim was called Ayatollah Sheikh Hassan Ali Murwarid. He was one of the senior ulama of the holy city of Mashhad. So Ayatollah Murwarid with Sayyid Abbas al-Mudarrisi go visit Sheikh Murtaba Ha'ari. My uncle says as we're sitting down there Ayatollah Murwarid looks at me and he says even though Ayatollah Ha'ari is your teacher but perhaps you don't know that in his lifetime he has visited Imam al Ridha 60 times. Now, Ayatollah al Ha'ari died about 25 years ago. So we're talking about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, when visiting Imam al Ridha wasn't as easy as it is today. You couldn't just buy a plane ticket and fly there, he would have to take a bus. He would, he would have to ride in uncomfortable cars, and he would use every available opportunity to visit Imam al by the way. So if the Hawza had a three-day holiday, he would buy a ticket on a bus, on the next available bus, and go straight to Mashhad. 
not check into a hotel or go to somebody's house, but go straight to the shrine of Imam al-Rida, visit him, and then come back. That's how much he loved Imam al-Rida. So Ayatollah Murwarid says to my uncle, he says, Shaykh al-Ha'ari has visited Imam al-Rida 60 times in his lifetime. Shaykh al-Ha'ari corrects Shaykh Murwarid and says that because Allah says in the Quran, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ And of the blessings of your Lord you should speak. That's why I'm correcting you. I'm not trying to be boastful. I'm not trying to brag. But I visited Imam al-Rida 64 times, not 60 times. So he says we hear this story, we pay our respects, we say our goodbyes, and we leave. A few months later, and as a result of that illness, Ayatollah al-Ha'ari passed away. My uncle says that I wasn't in Qum at the time when my teacher died and was buried. So I called one of my fellow students who studied under him to ask him how it all went. He says, I called him and I said, what happened? He said, well, you should have attended the funeral. MashaAllah, tens of thousands. The whole city of Qum turned out. Then we buried him, and he was laid to rest in the shrine of Bibi Ma'suma alayhi salam. He says, but that evening, on the first night, I saw a dream which didn't make much sense to me. My uncle said, what did you see? He said, well, I saw our teacher in my dream. And I asked him how he was and what had happened to him. So he described how it went after he was buried. He said to me that when I was lowered into my grave, even while I could hear the people outside of my grave taking part in the funeral, even when I could still hear their footsteps, the two angels came to begin my interrogation. In fact, this is in accordance to a hadith where the Imam says that the questioning begins even while the deceased can hear the footsteps of the people who had gathered to bury. So they came in order to question me. I was filled with fear. In fact, we have a hadith that says that the most difficult time that a person will have to endure is that first night after they're buried. He says, the fear that I felt was like nothing else I'd felt before. So they began to interrogate me. They began to question me. And as I was frightened, I heard the soothing, beautiful sound Someone speaking to me from a distance and saying to me, La takha, la takha, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And every time he said, La takha, the fear went away, little by little, until I had no fear. Then he came, and his face filled my grave with light, and I saw him. He introduced himself. He said, Ana Ali ibn Musa Rida. I am the eighth Imam. I am here to visit you. This is the part that this fellow student of my uncle says I couldn't understand. He said, then the Sheikh told me that Imam al rida said, I am here to visit you, it's, it's my first time, but I owe you another 63 visits. The student says, well, why 63? Why not 64? Why not 100? Why does the Imam owe him anything to begin with? So my uncle said, you don't know the answer. Let me tell you what the secret is. The secret is, he visited the imam 64 times. The imam has decided to pay him 64 visits. That was the first with many more to come. Imam al-Rida says in the hadith that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, brothers and sisters, that if you visit me in my mausoleum in my location of loneliness if anybody visits me i shall visit them on at least three occasions on the day of judgment the first is when they are giving out your rep your report cards when people are being delivered their actions in this world whether you are from ashab al-yameen or ashab al-shimal one of the most difficult stations of Qiyamah, Imam al-Rida says, I will be there to help you. The second is at the Sirat, the passageway, the bridge that connects the desert of Qiyamah with paradise and the fires, the smoldering 
inferno of hell right underneath. And the third is at the mizan, when our actions are being weighed. Imam Rada says, I will come to visit you, inshallah. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far says in a hadith as well, there are many, many traditions about the merits of the visitations of Imam al-Rida, which I really don't have time to get into, but suffice to say that Maraja have issued fatwa saying that the visitation of Imam al-Rida outweighs and is greater than the visitation of all the other Imams. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. What is the secret? What is the reason? There are things that we might be able to understand and there are aspects of them which we might not be able to understand. Why Imam al-Rida is so special, so unique in this respect? Perhaps it's because Imam al-Rida is the link between all the 12 Imams. Because up until Imam al-Rida, we had the Kaysaniya, we had the Zaydiya, we had the Ismailiya, we had people who followed five imams, six imams, seven imams, but we don't have a group that follows only eight imams. If you follow Imam al rida and if you submit to his authority as a divinely inspired imam, then you follow all the twelve imams. He is the link between all the twelve imams, which is why the hadith says, لا يزوره إلا الخواص من الشيعة Only the true Shia visit the imam. Only the twelve Shias visit Imam al rida Imam al kadhim says in a hadith that on the day of judgment, he says that on the right side of the throne of Allah, there will be arba'atun min al awaleen wa arba'atun min al akhireen. Four from the former prophets and four from the latter imams. The former prophets are Ibrahim, wa Nuh, wa Musa, wa Isa. Imagine the seat of power. The seat of glory. Who's sitting on this pulpit? Ibrahim, Nuh, Musa, and Isa. Then the Imam says, and from the four latter Imams and personalities, we have Rasulullah, Ali, Wal Hassan, Wal Hussein. Then the other Imams will come and line up. And right next to us, Yakunu Zuwar, Quburina. It'll be those who visit our shrines. وَيَكُونُ أَعْظَمَهُمْ حَبْوَةً وَأَقْرَبُهُمْ مَكَانَةً And those who are closest to us from among all those who visit the Imams, زُوَّارُ وَلَدِي عَلِي are the ones who visit my son, Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. Now, brothers and sisters, this holy, infallible Imam, this merciful Imam, this compassionate Imam was so compassionate that even Ma'moon came to him one day. His own killer came to him. And he said to him, I don't have a child. I have this wife. I love her so much. But I don't have any children from her. So the Imam prayed for him. He said, you will bear a child from this woman. Next year, Ma'moon himself says, I took my newborn son. I wrapped him with a cloth. And I took him to Imam al rida to thank him. For he was the one who prayed and gave me this offspring. How merciful are you, O Ali ibn Musa al rida that you would even, your mercy would envelop even your enemy, Ma'mun. So imagine how the Imam would treat us. Imagine how the Imam would treat those who truly love him. Those who have spent the last two months in mourning and commemoration, commemoration and crying for his grandfather Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Imam al Rida alayhi salam says to Aba Salt al Harawi, he says to him, If I come out of the palace of Ma'mun al Abbasi, and you see my Aba placed over my head, then it means that I have been poisoned. Do not speak to me. Do not approach me. But if my Aba is not placed over my head, then it means your Imam is safe. Imagine what went through the mind of Abbas Salt al-Harawi. 
while waiting for Imam al-Rida to come out. How will he meet and greet his Imam? Suddenly he sees Imam al-Rida come out with his Aba placed over his head. He says, I knew at that moment that Imam al-Rida had been poisoned. What I didn't know was the extent that the poison had penetrated the Imam's body, the damage that it had caused. He says, because I noticed that the Imam went from the doorstep of Ma'moon to his own doorstep. How far it was, I don't know. But I do know that they were neighbors. So how many meters, how many feet, I don't know. But he says, in those very short, in that very short distance, I saw Imam al rida sit down from the pain and then stand back up again. And he did that 50 times. He then went into his home. He looked at me. He said, Ya Abba Sayyid, close this door. Do not let anyone enter my home. Let me die. Let me die alone without anybody disturbing me. Imam al rida went inside. Abba Salt says, I saw him then go to his bed. He lied on his bed. But the poison was so powerful that the Imam began rolling on the sand in the courtyard. <laughs> Sallallahu alayk Ya Mawlai Ya Aba Muhammad I will do this tonight Imam al-Rida himself says to Ibn Shabib He says Ya Ibn Shabib In kunta baqiyan ala shay' Fabki ala jaddi al Hussein. Ya Ibn Shabib If you want to cry for anybody then cry for my grandfather, Abba Abdullah. So, Ya Imam al Riva, I will do exactly as you asked. I will recite the Masaib of Abba Abdullah al Hussein for you. I will say, Ya Ali ibn Musa al Riva, you died all alone in a strange land. Yes, that is true, that is painful. But, O oh Master, when you were there in that home, you asked Abba Sal to close the door so that no one would come after you. No one had their eye on your shirt, Ya Ali ibn Musa Rida. No one want to strip your undergarments. Ya Ali ibn Musa Rida. Yes, you were rolling on the sand in your courtyard. But those sands couldn't be hotter than the sands of Karbala. Ya Mawlai! Yes, they killed you. Yes, they poisoned you. But no one want to decapitate you. No one want to sever your head. Ya Ali ibn Musa Rida, they did all that they did to you. But, O oh Mawla, O oh my Master, they didn't then ambush your house, attack your household, attack your women and your children. Imam al Riva says, Yabn Shabib, in kuntabakian ala shay. If you're going to cry, then cry for my grandfather Hussein. But why? Yabn Rasulullah. What about your grandfather? He says, Because they slaughtered him like a sheep. Allahu Akbar. Ya Aba Abdullah. They slaughtered you like a sheep. They then cut you into pieces like an animal. But that's where all the similarities end. When they bring a sheep to be slaughtered, first they quench the sheep's thirst. First they feed that sheep. Whereas Abba Abdullah kept saying, وَحَقْ jaddi ana عَطْشَانِ I ask you in the name of my grandfather Rasulullah, 
I am thirsty, and yet they left him to die without water. That is one main difference. Do you want to hear more? Allahu Akbar. Traditions tell us that when you want to sacrifice an animal, when you wish to slaughter a sheep, make sure you don't do it in front of its children. Don't do it in front of the other sheep. And yet Zainab was standing there. So was Sakina and Rabab and Ruqayya. When Abba Abdullah was attacked. One more, one more difference. Let me mention this. Ya Ali ibn Musa Ridha, I apologize. Traditions tell us that when you slaughter a sheep, use a sharp blade. <laughs> Use a sharp blade so that the animal doesn't suffer. And yet they attacked Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Imam al Sadiq says, بالسيوف, A group came with, with swords. بالرماح, others had spears. بالحجارة, others were carrying rocks. They didn't have time to go to their homes and bring their swords. Imam Zain al-Abideen says something else that will break your heart. The Imam says that there was a group of people who came. They didn't carry swords or spears or even rocks. They were too old to carry a weapon. So all they carried was sticks. After everyone was done with Abba Abdullah, this group came to his body. They began beating it with their sticks. Now you might be thinking, you might be saying, but a stick is nothing compared to a sword or a spear, right? But I'll tell you what a stick says. A stick means you mean nothing to us. A stick says, where is your Abbas now, O oh Hussein? Where are your companions? Where is your Akbar and Qasim? Where are the ones who said that we would rather be killed a thousand times, be burnt and have our ashes dispersed, than see anything happen to our Imam? Where are you now when Abba Abdullah is being ambushed? Lady Zainab screams out, Amma fikum Muslim! Is there no Muslim among you? What are you doing to the grandson of Rasulullah? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم نا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين